tonight to adore you. We come, Father God, to lift you. We come, Lord, to praise you and to honor you. Now, Lord, we come asking you, Father God, to forgive us for sin. For we realize, Father God, you are God, and beside you there is none of it. We ask you to bless us in your word tonight, that your word will go forth, that our lives will be made the better, that men, women, boys, and girls will be made the better. Father God, that we will always honor you in all that we do. We pray that you bless us now as we study your word, that your word, Father God, will speak to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 is where we are tonight. Matthew chapter 22 is where we are tonight. We're going to talk about prioritizing your life. How do you prioritize your life? Jesus gives us the answer of how to prioritize our lives. Jesus gives us the answer on how to prioritize our lives. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse number 34. Matthew 22, verses 34 through verse 40. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Everybody there? Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Jesus is talking, and he's talking about prioritizing. And there's no greater priority other than love. Amen. But Jesus talks about prioritizing your life. And he says to do it through the element of love. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. We got to love one another. We got to love the Lord. Amen. And we got to prioritize our lives. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Very familiar lesson for tonight, so you ought to be able to engage right. in order to be, to be informed. Amen? Amen? Matthew 22, Verses 34 through 40. Jesus is talking. He's in a dialogue. Matthew records it. Luke records it. Mark records it. But Matthew records it like this, beginning at verse number 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, Ask him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first in the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments 
hang all the law in the prophets. Talk about prioritizing. When we look at the pericope, we find out that something got us to this point. A conversation brought Jesus to this point. Throughout the Bible, we find that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were always trying to catch Jesus in something. The religious folk, people who, who set the standard, the religious people, people who said that they were righteous, always tried to catch Jesus in something. So this particular chapter, this particular pericope is the same. It's nothing different about it. So the Sadducees is here talking. Just before that, we find the, the, the Pharisees are talking. And they're only trying to catch Jesus up. They're only asking questions. They're only making suggestions. They're only making statements to, keep, to catch Jesus up. To find him in a dilemma. Or to place him in a dilemma. They're always trying to catch Jesus up. So one person says, the Pharisees are fair, you see. And the Sadducees are sad, you see. But see, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So when you look at the Pericope prior to this, they, they bring out the fact that the, the resurrection ought to be addressed, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection. So they didn't believe in the resurrection. So they tried to catch him up. And when we move to verse number 32, uh, 34 rather, after the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced, had silenced, had shut the mouths of the Sadducees, they gathered together. They, they huddled. They gathered together. They, they came up with a plan. They gathered together. And they did it after the Sadducees were silenced. They gathered together. Then one of them, the lawyer, as in Jesus' day, even in our day, we find people depending on the lawyer to speak up. And this lawyer was speaking up for the sake of religion. So there's always somebody in the crowd smart, right? And they're always smarter than the teacher. They always got a better idea than the teacher. There's somebody missing here tonight that has a better idea and can do it better than the teacher. Now check this out. They've never put themselves in the position of the teacher. But they always have a better idea than the teacher. Isn't that something? They got a better idea. They, they know how to do it better. I mean, they, they show up once a year. They sit in a class once a year. They don't put themselves out in the deep, they stay in the shallow water. But they always, Sister Bernie has a better idea. They always look to catch up the teacher. So let's see what it says. It says that when he, the, the, Matthew says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. What do you think they gathered together concerned? What do you think the conversation was about? They wanted to kill him. We find that out later for sure. Why do you think they gathered together? Why would they want to kill an innocent man? Why would they want to kill Jesus, somebody who has come to rescue them? They feel they're better. <clears throat> Say again? They feel that they're better. Okay, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees felt that they were better. I can go with that. 
Jesus was telling the truth. Right. <laughs> so the word said they didn't believe in him. That's good. And that's true. But Jesus got on their nerves. Right. <laughs> Paul and Jesus called them vipers. What's a viper? Serpent, snakes. Snakes. Why would they call why would Jesus call them snakes? Because this is everything. They would sneak around and they were always trying to catch him up. Do you have a greater respect for somebody that can look you in your face and tell you the truth? Yes. Than somebody that you usurp or go around or, or try something differently or try a different approach. So they were vipers. They were, he called them a brood of vipers. A group of vipers. Group of snakes. What do you know about a snake? Anybody know anything about a snake? Yeah, they are. What what did you say? Some will kill you, some will not. The sneaky slurping. Snakes are sneaky. What did you say, Sister Wood? I'm scared of them. You're scared of them. That's a good thing to know. You're scared of them. Let me tell you something. If I, got, if I see a snake before he sees me, it doesn't matter what kind of snake it is, it doesn't matter his address, it doesn't matter his type. If I see him before he sees me, he's a dead snake. Because snakes cannot be trusted. Snakes will even act like they like you. Jesus called the Pharisees and the Sadducees snakes, vipers. So Sister Burns said they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him because he just told it like he did. Some preachers' lives are in danger because they preach the word of God. And they preach the truth. Isn't that something? Their lives are in danger. So here it is. Jesus has already shut the Sadducees down. Now the Pharisees shows up. Verse 35. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. What does that say to us? He asked him a question to put Jesus to the test. What does it mean when he says put him to the test? See if he can answer. See will he answer properly. If he can trip him up. Isn't that something? It's all about tripping up Jesus. It's all about tripping him up. It's not about whether he they believe in the religion or not. It's it's not about whether or not Jesus is the true God or not. It's all about making him look bad and tripping him up. You know, we don't have business meetings at the New Beginning Church. We have vision meetings. And one of the reasons why we don't have business meetings is because business meetings do not show you where you're going and how to better yourself. Business meetings become fighting meetings. Arguing meetings. Scaring children meetings. There are some children right today that's, that's in their 40s that's been terrified at business meetings. But when you have a vision meeting, Sister Davis, you, you cast vision. You tell people where we are and you tell people where God is showing us where to go. It's called vision meeting. We have a vision. We are going together to, to work on our vision. One pastor stood, he cast a vision, and he said, this is what God is leading us. And one guy says, I'm against it. I'm against it. Meaning that he's against it. So a, a wise man was visiting that night. A wise seasoned pastor, a retired pastor was visiting that night. So he interjected and he said, well, brother, how long have you been praying about this? He asked the pastor first, how long have you been praying about this? The pastor said, I've been praying about this for three years, and I believe now is the time. He asked the guy that said he was against it, or against it is what he said. The guy that was against it, he asked him, he said, well, how long have you been praying about this? He said, I just heard it today. <laughs> well, why are you against it? Well, the bottom line is the pastor has been praying about it for three years. And you haven't prayed about it for two seconds. But you come to the conclusion that you're against it. And that it's not of God. And we should not be headed in this direction. 
Isn't that something? And time after time after time after time again, people find themselves against it. Regardless of what goes on, regardless of what is presented, they are against it. But they haven't prayed about it. They haven't thought about it. And people know they can snap off the handle. And they can come to conclusions. Here it is. They tried to catch him up. So they, they chose the one who was qualified to catch him up. A lawyer. When you go to court, the lawyer asks a bunch of rhetorical questions. And the rhetorical questions are not questions that are being asked for you to answer. It's questions, these are questions that are being asked so you can catch up the witness or catch up the other lawyer. And it's the same in the text. This is not something new. This, is, this has been going on since the days of Jesus Christ. So this lawyer, the smart one in the, drunk, in the bunch, the, the educated one in the bunch, not only knew the law, he knew the law. He knew the word of God. So he asked a question to get him up. You ever seen anything like that before? You ever heard anything like that? And, and, and usually it's the smart one that the people appoint to get the leader up. And I found out that the one they appoint to catch the leader up is the one that bagged down the quickest because it's not his or her idea. So here he is. Teacher, verse 36. Which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus always answers the question right on time and in the right way. Which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you should love the Lord your God. This word love is, it comes from the word of God. It is unconditional love. It is the same word we get the word beloved. It's an unconditional love. It's a love that I'm going to love you regardless of what you say about me. I'm going to love you regardless of how you treat me. I'm going to love you regardless of how I believe you neglected me. I'm still going to love you. This is God kind of love. It is both social and moral. It is both friendship type of love and the God type of love. It is family type of love. I am going to love you. The problem is, many times people love their families, but they can't love other people. So he says, he says, you shall love the Lord your God. You should love the Lord your God. This Lord, the supreme one, the one of supremacy, the controller, you ought to love him. When we confess Christ as our Lord, He's the one who controls our very most, our innermost being. Are you letting Christ control you? Are you running things? How many people like running things? Raise your hand way up in there. All of you online, just raise your hand way up in there and say, say, preacher, be honest with yourself. I love running things. But Jesus, being your Lord, he's your controller. He, he tells you how to run things. He tells you how to live. He tells you how to interject yourself in conversations and he, he constructs your life. I mean, if you are going to let the greatest priorities be the greatest priorities, you will have to let God be your Lord. Let Jesus be your Lord. Okay, let me ask you this. I guess I can get some, get some hands on this one. How many of you allowing God to be, allowing Jesus to be your Lord? Anybody? Sometimes? Every now and then? Do we, do, do we all the time allow him? You can't say that. You don't all the time allow him? Because we're human. So humans just go off, right? <laughs> really? Steve Harvey said he's trying to stop cussing. He said he's a Christian, but he's trying to stop cussing. 
So is he allowing the Lord to be his Lord, to lead, direct, and guide him? Now, cussing ain't the worst thing you can do, but cussing is not a God, right? And people will tell you certain curse words, they say, that's in the Bible. The question becomes, is it used that way in the Bible with that purpose in mind? So we are situ situational. Jesus wants to be our Lord. Jesus not only wants to be your Savior, he wants to be your Lord. The word Lord means controller. The word Lord means your owner, your master. He has lordship over your life when he's able to lead God, direct you. And if you allow him to lead God and direct you, he will protect you. Any witness in the house? If you allow him to lead God and direct you, he will protect you. But I'm a witness, he'll do it. No, he doesn't do everything we want, every way we want it. But check this out. When we look at other people's lives, right. their lives are worse off than ours. Right. If you're sitting, if you're standing, if you're listening, there's always somebody's life that's worse off than yours. That's right. And you got to deal with what's, what's on the table. You have to deal with what's on the table. And let me tell you, sometimes sadness is on the table. Sometimes misery is on the table. Sometimes junk is on the table. And you just got to deal with what's on the table. Some writer says it like this in what the church song it says, you got to know when to hold them, know how to hold them, and know when to fold them. You got to count your blessings. Use what you dealt with. And let God bless you in it. Use what God gives you. Don't complain. Too many people complain about what they don't have. And they're not, they're not rejoicing in the Lord over what they do have. Allow God to be your Lord. Allow Jesus to be your controller, your master. It says, you should love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. Love him. This divine magistrate, this word magistrate, the divine one, it, it gives us the Lord God as our judge. He is the final judge. He is deity God. God is our deity. He, the, the theos in the Greek. He is the supreme divinity. He's exceeding God. He's the one that you need to serve and lend your loyalty to. I used to question when they used to make us stand up and put our hands over our hearts. Pledge allegiance to the flag. I wouldn't look that word allegiance up. I really want to pledge my allegiance to the Lord. There are people who will pledge their allegiance to the flag, but they won't pledge their allegiance to the Lord. When people get so upset because a person take a knee on a flag, and they don't get upset when a person take a knee on a man's neck. Mm. What do you think they're pledging their allegiance? Mm. When they can take stuff and rearrange it in such a way where they can say that you're disrespecting the flag, therefore you're disrespecting the United States of America, and they, they are up in arms because you take a knee and don't pledge your allegiance to the flag. But they, can, they will not get excited. They will not move. And they will not uh, support you if they see a man take a knee on another man's neck until he takes his last breath. And after he's dead and gone, after he said, I can't breathe, no one is getting, certain groups are not getting in arms about it. You think they pledge their allegiance to the Lord? We can pledge our allegiance to the flag, but we can't pledge our allegiance to the Lord God. He says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart. This heart is your inner 
most affections. Pledge your allegiance to the Lord with your innermost affections. Your affections. How you feel. What excites you. Jesus says, this is a great commandment. And you need to make sure that regardless of what else you do, you need to have your affection set on the Lord God. I'm just talking about prioritizing. I mean, I'm just talking, Jesus put it in a priority. He says the first great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the word heart is your inner most affection. See, people can't see your affections. You can show them something, but they really, really, really can't see your affections. You can act like you're affectionate, but they really can't see it. They really can't see it. They said love is an action word. I don't care how many flowers you bring. It's the motivation inside. It's the motives that you look forward to. It's, a, it's what you look forward to getting and receiving from what you just did. Your innermost affections. So the question is, do you love your pastor because you just love your pastor? And your innermost affection is turned toward loving him? You ought not love your pastor more than you love your God. Amen, Amen goes right there. Because I'm convinced if you love your God and you love the right God, you wouldn't have a problem with loving your pastor. It says love the Lord God with all your heart. Second thing he says is love the Lord your God with all your soul. This word soul here is all your consciousness. All of your cousin, you all to love the Lord your God with whatever is in you that you're conscious about. Love it. Unconditional love. That's what God has for us. You ought to love him. Whatever you think about, you ought to love him with all of it. Whatever you're conscious of, you ought to love him. With all your, your heart, with all your soul. You ought to love him. With all of it. All of it. Every drop of it. Love him. Why do we love God? Why do you love God? Just give me an example why you love God. I, I love the Lord because he has uh, brought me from a mighty long way. Okay. Much prayer and he has covered many things that I've asked for. He may have not been right on time. But I love the Lord because he gave his son, his only begotten son, that okay. I may live. That I've gone through, I know there's God. Okay, so we love the Lord because what He's done for us. Anybody else love the Lord? Anybody else thinking about loving the Lord? Brother D. Glass, you, you thinking about it? Yep. You love it? Yes, Why you love it? Because He first loved me. I see. That's just a David's line. <laughs> That's her line. So if God hadn't loved you, you wouldn't love Him. Is that is that what you're saying? Is that not what you're saying? Ah, look at how you look at that. If God didn't love you first, you wouldn't love him. That's what you just said, right? Yeah, yeah that's what you said. That's exactly what you said. I asked you, why do you love God? And you said, because he loves me and he loved me first. Or because he first loved me. Is, are you creating a song or are you telling me the truth? I love the Lord because he first loved me, right? But what about if God doesn't do what you want him to do? You still love You still have to love him? So we obligated to love him? But what do you do with people who don't love him? Well, I'm trying to let them know about who he is, what he does, can't do. Okay, who else loves the Lord in the room? Anybody else love the Lord? Why you love him? Who wants to tell me why you love him? Like Sister Barrington said, he gave his son to die for mm -hmm. us. So if he hadn't given your son, his son to die for you, you wouldn't love him? So he, 
God, he expressed his love, so he showed us how to love. He expressed his love, so he showed us how to love. Right. All right. Why, why did God give his son an innocent man for guilty folk? Because God is love. Right. He loved us. Right? Yes. And so, so David says that he has expressed his love for us. Therefore, he's showing us how to love. Sacrificial love. He says, not only should you love the Lord thy God with all your soul, love the Lord your God with all your, your heart, but you also should love the Lord your God with all your mind. All of your mind. This word mind is your imagination and your understanding. With your imagination and with your understanding. What is he saying to us? He's saying we have an understanding of who God is, but we ought to have an imagination of what he is better, of what he has not revealed. We ought to be like John on the island of Patmos. Revelation John on the island of Patmos. The revelator says, he says to us that I saw a number that no man could number. What John is doing, he is putting into words for humans to understand what heaven looks like. But in all actuality, John really can't describe what God really is like. He's just bringing it down to our level. Because eyes haven't seen. Ears haven't heard. What God has in store for those who obey him and love him. Isn't that something? Ears haven't heard. Give me a give me a earthly demonstration of that. Give me an earthly demonstration of your imagination, what you never could imagine that it would turn out this way. Good or bad? He allowed me to work for 42 years. He allowed me to work for 42 years. You could never, the, your first day when you signed on the line and said, hey, I, I agree to these benefits, you never would have thought it would be 42 years. I was going to leave after my vacation. You're going to leave after your vacation? My first vacation. You sound like a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> That's what millennials do. They already come in the door, ready to leave. So, Tell me, tell me, tell me what happened or what can you see or what can you imagine? What did you not imagine that happened and you couldn't even see that it was going to happen that way? Good or bad? Anybody? The pandemic, is the pandemic is something that we could never, ever imagine. Never, ever. We could never imagine it. Never, never, never. And some of us still sleep on it. Some of us still don't get the, get the message. Some of us still missing the memo. Yeah. And then another thing we can't imagine about the pandemic, once we get this strand halfway under control, another strand shows up. And it goes from worse to worse to worse. And we never, how many people thought they would be locked in their house for, for three months? How many people thought that church would be shut down for a year? Yeah. A whole year. And some churches are not even back in session yet. Could you imagine that? And check this out. This is what I couldn't imagine about the pandemic. I could never have imagined the people that wouldn't come before the pandemic would bother me so much to open the church back up. And let me tell you another part of that I can't imagine. I cannot imagine that people will bother me and torment me to open the church back up when they weren't coming before the pandemic and now they still haven't come since we opened it back up. I couldn't even imagine. It blows my mind. It's a trip. It's a trip. It's, I mean, it's a strong gas, honey. If you're over 40, you understand it blows, it, it, it blows my mind. How in the world can we even imagine who God is, what he's like, what he does, and what he will do? We, we just got, 
The book of Revelation in, in all 66 books just gives us a tip of the iceberg. We can't even imagine. The, the saints that's gone on before us, we back here crying over them, and they wouldn't dare come back. I said the saints now. Those who are believers, those who love the Lord. And check this out. Some of the saints that have gone on before us, they are getting great rewards. Some people just make it into heaven. But the saints that I know, they're, they're being rewarded. They're being rewarded for how they act. They're being rewarded for how, how they felt. They're being rewarded by how they, they, they did things. They're being rewarded by, by based on how, what they saw. And check this out. Some of them are missing rewards because of those same reasons. Sure. It's right here in the text. It says, love the Lord, first of all, with all your heart, all your inner affection. Secondly, with all your soul, with your consciousness. And thirdly, with all your mind. And the mind, the mind is the thoughts, the understanding, and the reasoning. Your imagination. Your mind, your thoughts, your understanding, your reasoning, your imagination. God is concerned about your motives. Why you do that? Why you act like that? Why you say that? And now we have tweet. Why did you tweet that? Why did you email that? Jack, why did you text that? God is concerned about our reasons. Why? So Jesus says, you got to love the Lord with your heart with your soul, and with your mind. He follows it up by saying, this is the first and great commandment. He said, this is the first and great commandment. This is the first and great commandment. He says, this is your first priority. This is your first priority. Regardless of what happens in your life, this ought to be your first priority. If it's not your first priority, then you're not operating in the great commandment. Your love for the Lord. Your love for him. With your soul. Your heart. With your mind. In other words, with all your might. I love the Lord. Remember, this word love is agape. This, this agape love is the love that is unconditional. But check this out. Jesus goes on to tell us the second. And that no good neighbor you got. Look at what he says. He says, he says, verse 39, and the second is like it. What is it? The, the first commandment, right? So he says, I'm about to tell you the second one now. But the second one is like which one? The first one. And in the first one he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Then he comes back and says, he says, in the second one is like the first one. He says, I'm, I'm getting ready to really drop a bomb on you now. He said, you thought that it was something for me to say, love the Lord. Now I'm really getting ready to tell you what, how to grow a piece of road. He says, the second one is like it, like the first one. You shall love your neighbor uh -oh, as you love yourself. He says, says to us, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In other words, with all your might. And the second commandment is like the first. And the first commandment talk about loving the Lord. He says the second commandment is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look at the parts. He, put God, he puts God first. He says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
Let's see what the word neighbor, what is the word neighbor? What do you think he's talking about when he says love your neighbor as yourself? What is the word neighbor? Anyone you meet. Anyone you meet. The homeless person. Is he talking about the person next door or down the street? Not necessarily. Yes or no, maybe so? Yes. He can be included. The neighbor is included down the street. He says, love the Lord your God. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In other words, with all your might. And the second commandment is as the first. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And anybody in their right mind have a love for themselves. I say anybody in their right mind. There are some people that's not in their right mind. Yeah. And there are some people that are on the edge. If you're on the edge tonight, I want to say to you, love the Lord and you can love yourself. Jesus says there's a priority. He, he puts forth a three-step priority right before us. The first priority, love God. The second priority, love yourself. The third priority, love others. Prioritize. And people have said, and I'm, be, I'm beginning to believe it, if a person doesn't love themselves, they can't love anybody else. And let me just let me just give you a little counseling note right now. If you got a marriage and it's 50-50, was it Teddy Pendergrass said, I got a 50-50 love? Come on, y'all ain't been saved all, all your lives now. Yeah, Sister Hughes, was it Teddy Pendergrass? He said, I got a 50-50 love. Right? But let me just, just straighten things out for you. If you got a 50% man and a 50% woman, you don't make 100%. Everybody has to buy in 100% in order for it to be 100%. You have to make sure that you give 100%. You can't give 50, she give 50 and, and, and try to think that it's going to come up to 100. Every person has to give 100%. If you're a church member and you come to the conclusion, I am going to give 50% or less, you're not, you're not 100% church member. You're not, you're not all in. When you're all in, you make sacrifices. When you're all in, you give of yourself. When you're all in, you don't let things complicate you to the point you just throw up your hands. When you're all in, you prioritize. You put things in order. And Jesus sets the order tonight. Love the Lord. Love yourself. Love your neighbor. Now, who did y'all say the neighbor is? Anybody you come in contact with. That's what you all said, right? So if you're going to love the Lord, you're going to love yourself. And you're going to love your neighbor. And Jesus says the first commandment is just like the second one. And the second commandment is just like the first. If that's the case, then you got to love them with all your heart, right. with all your soul, mm -hmm. and with all your mind. So, Spartan, what did you say about that? You still growing? Yep. My, my, my. How did I know that? How did I know you, you were about to say, I'm just, I'm not there yet. How many people said, I'm not there yet? Sometimes people are just making you this big standoff. It's just, you have to really be disciplined. You got to be disciplined. To love somebody who we were talking about is like a snake. <laughs> but you want to just. But check this out. Jesus called them a brood of vipers, but he still loved them. Paul calls them snakes in the grass, but he still loves them. They set examples for us. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you do know that every neighbor that you have, and you all said that it's person anybody you come in contact with, right? Every neighbor who you, who you run in contact with is not clean and polished. 
is not sanctimonious. Every neighbor you have is not just like you like it. I know y'all know that because some of the men that you've got wasn't polished. Some of the women Deacon Apple that run in contact, come in contact with, they went bodies. How do I know that? Because there was a woman I came in contact with. Woo! They were nothing like being polished. But we like to love the lovable. But God teaches us to love the least, the lost, and the left out. Can you do that? Jesus says you can. Because Jesus never orders us to do anything we can't do. It says it right here, Matthew 22, 30, 34 through 40. It says love. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Then verse 40 he says, on these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. What he says is that these two commandments set the whole record straight. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. When he says heart, he means your inner affections, your innermost being. When he says soul, he means all your consciousness. <laughs> so you can be conscious of somebody mistreating you, but Jesus says love them. How can you tell when you've forgiven one? Can anybody help me here? How can you tell when you have forgiven one, when you've forgiven somebody? How can you tell? Y'all haven't forgiven anybody? That's why you can't tell? Come on, talk to me now. If I write to that, my chef is someone, and then they call me and ask me for something, I would love to know I'll help them, but... But you haven't forgiven them? No, we need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then I haven't forgiven So you haven't forgiven Okay, give me an example of how you know when you have forgiven somebody. When you can be in the same room or whatever, around us, have a conversation with them, start back talking to them again. Okay. So you don't have to bring the issue up, and, and you can have a conversation with them. Anybody else? Sister, Sister Lou, I mean, Sister Richard, we be about to say something. Sister Richard, who's the last, and you don't have to tell us the name, but the last person you forgave, how did you know you had forgiven that person? Because I don't think about what they've done. Don't think about what they've done. Anybody else? No one else? Let me tell you how I know when I'm forgiven somebody. When it doesn't hurt anymore. When, when it don't feel the same. The reason why you, you need to forgive people is because they hurt you, right? Well, why, why, why would you not have to forgive somebody? So what are you, what are you holding against them if it didn't hurt? But what they did hurt, right? Am I the only person on planet Earth that feels this way? <laughs> so tell me, help me tonight, teach me tonight. How do you know when you've forgiven somebody? That's what, like what I said, you know, I know someone that's wronged me. If they need me, I So when they did you wrong, did they hurt you? Yes. Okay, you got that one now. I got one person on planet Earth with me. Anybody else? So today. How do you know when you have forgiven somebody? I'm trying to think of something you forgive me for. Maybe you need forgiveness for something that's like. Do you just avoid them? I mean, you... You avoid them? I mean, do you... Uh, no, you just let go and let go and have it. It doesn't phase you anymore. doesn't phase you anymore. Okay. So you can go out to eat with them. You, matter of fact, you call them up and say, hey, let's go to lunch. No, we're not going there. No, we're not going that far. Wait a minute now. He's a church folk I'm talking to. Am I talking to Christians though? My children have distanced from me. Mm -hmm. So I know that I'm their mother, that I've helped them, and will still help them as much as I can. But that hurt me. I'm their mother. There's that hurt. There's that word again. So uh, I don't just go all out trying to find them and stuff. And even when I did, it was an insult. So I still said, Lord, I okay. pray that my children live the life I live. So she's supporting my case. Is there anybody in the room who can tell me? Or anybody on social media that can tell me? Or anybody on the internet that can tell me? What happens and how you know you've forgiven somebody? Are y'all forgiving people? Uh-uh, 
Sister Hughes is getting ready to tell me. I, I, I can feel it coming. How do you know when you have forgiven somebody? Or do you know? Or you just avoid it? Or you just don't express it? But check this out. When I choose not to talk about it, do I have the same attitude against them? So who are you going to talk to about it? I mean, you, uh, if, uh, I have been told that if you let it go, let it go. By my, by okay, my when you get home, look at this. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Look at that one. The Bible teaches how we ought to deal with conflict. Matthew 18, 15 through 18. The Bible teaches us how we ought to deal with conflict. He said, the Bible says, the sister David punches me in my nose. I ought to go to a one-on-one. -on -one. I shouldn't break them before the church Sunday. So she can punch you again? <laughs> It says I should go to a one on one. Talk about it. But we skip over steps. And we get in a hurry with steps. It says, and this is this is a long period of time. This is not next day, next day, next day. But some some of us need some time to process things. Number one, the person still is reeling and rocking. Number two, you still reeling and rocking. So during that period, you need to be in prayer. And hopefully that person is in prayer. But it says, Matthew 18, 15 through 18 says, you go to them one-on-one -on -one and you sell the problem because if you do, you have won a sister or brother. And if you can't solve the problem between the two of you, you take two or three other people. And you don't go get your, your posse now. Like you, you don't go get your game. You go get somebody who's spiritual, someone who's not partial, and you take those people with you, and when you take them with you, y'all sell the issue because that way you can you can win a brother or sister. Got a hand here, then a hand there. Yes, ma'am. Sister Henry says, I know I have forgotten forgiving someone when I treat them as though nothing wrong has happened between us. Thank you, Sister Henry. <laughs> I know that I have forgiven someone when I treat them like nothing has ever gone wrong. You're not I got two persons on planet Earth with me. No. So when it doesn't hurt anymore, and when you treat them properly as if they never did anything, you're forgiving them. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I had a hand back here first. Oh, you just spoke out loud, right? Go ahead. Go ahead. That's the same. This, this is what I said. Like, I, I just go on. I don't, you know, cause a problem. Okay. I do forgive. Just go on. You forgive them. Do they need to know they forgive them? Yes. Not necessarily. Nah. Okay, hand right here. <laughs> Good point. She says, sometimes people are dead and gone, and you, you forgive them after they're dead and gone. They will never know how you really forgive them, but it does so much for you. You have to set yourself free. When you find people are in bondage today because they won't forgive. And check this out. The person that you are not forgiven is going on, and they're making somebody else life miserable. Or they have come to a conclusion that they're going to be happy with a different person. And you still in money. Every time you see them, you turn and go the other way. Every time you see them, you get mad all over again. I have gotten so angry before I could feel. I, could act, I used to think that was just a statement. But I could actually feel the blood boiling in my veins. I mean, I could just feel it. You know, anybody else in the room human? I could just, when I saw them, when I heard their voices, I could just feel the blood. I mean, the blood turns into to a boiling vapor in my veins. And guess what? It hurted no one but me. I'm the one in prison. But when you forgive, you're set free. 
Jesus says there's a priority here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your mind. This word mind means all your imagination, all your reason. Love the Lord. Then he says, the second one, as it's like the first. And the first says to love with everything within you. And then he comes back to say, and that neighbor you have. Now he wouldn't have to tell us to love the neighbor if we were loving that neighbor, right? And he wouldn't have to tell us to love the person that was not doing us wrong, right? If the person was loving us, it's easy. It's easy to love people who love us. It's easy. I mean, you, you can have dinner together. You can do coffee together. I mean, it's easy to love somebody who loves you and show you love. But the problem comes when they are unlovable. But Jesus loves the unlovable. Questions or comments? Well, y'all just, I guess forgiveness is a big thing, huh? Love is a major issue, huh? Right. And so people cannot be, not everyone is going to be receptive. Exactly. That's why you got that prayer time in between the time you confront that person or talk to that person, right? Confront is not a good word. In the time you, you negotiate or discuss. Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, I'm not saying that everybody should be Right, so, so she's saying that one person went to another person and tried to reason with her, but that person is so bitter, and we get bitter, right? Mm -hmm. We get so bitter until we don't want to hear it. But she's not bitter because the girl did something to her. She's just a bitter person. There are some bitter people in this world. I know some of them. They're y'all cousins. <laughs> y'all cousins. You yeah. all... Okay, let me speak proper English. Th these people belong to you and they're in your family. So, at the end of the day, it's not their responsibility. God doesn't hold them. Doesn't hold them in accountability. He holds us in accountability. Who is us? Who is us when I say us? Christians, right? We carry Christ's name. Those of us who are Christians, Christians, those of us who are Christians, those of us who are Christians, those of us who are Christ-like, God holds us accountable. Judgment will begin at the house of prayer, at the house of the Lord. Isn't that something? When, when your children were growing up, you didn't care if the people down the street son had something to say, if they were in a mob and they all got in trouble, you didn't go to get the one out of trouble down the street. You went to get yours out of trouble. And guess what you told them when you got home? I don't care what they did. I'm responsible for you. Y'all remember that? You remember the, the Boston, the Boston, the Boston um, mob that was fighting the, in, in Boston. They, they were rioting in Boston. And this woman saw her son on TV. Oh, yeah. She saw her son because she recognized his jacket. Yeah. And she went out there and she beat him back to the house. Yeah. And she said some choice words. I guess some children, you just have to say some words to them that they understand. Yeah. If you don't get your, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she beat him. And then after she realized she was on tape and, and she said, oh, Lord, my church and my pastor are going to hear me cussing. But that boy said his mama saved his life. The police said it too. And the police said it too. So at the, at the end of the day, we have to get to a point where we love people like that woman loves her child. Amen. Because guess what? We are going to the ends of the world for our children. And our children turn their backs on us. They act a fool for us. 
I mean, like the food on us. No loyalty. But we have to continue to love. That's what Jesus did. He, he died to an unlovable world, to for an unlovable world. Gave his life, the ultimate sacrifice. And we can't even sacrifice just a little discipline. Just a little tongue lashing. Some of us can't even stand for folks not to speak to us. Uh, some of us can't stand for people not to look our way. And here Jesus is, going to, to Calvary with a cross, nailed to it, dying, misused, buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus didn't even have his own tomb. Here we are now, some mothers and grandmothers buy six, seven plots. Jesus didn't even have his own plot. But he rose for you and for me. Amen. There may be somebody listening tonight who never confessed Christ as their Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Just to leave in the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. That he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And under that third day morning, he rose from the dead. You need to make this your priority today to get to know Jesus. We're at the end of the year, a few days left. But none of us are guaranteed that we will make it into 2022. But Jesus the Christ gave his life to you. And you can be saved right here, right now, today. Just repeat after me and invite him into your life. Believe in the story. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that you prayed this prayer. You're now born again. We believe that you're on your way to heaven. And regardless of what happened, you have set forth the first priority. And the first priority is to have eternal life. Thank you so much for watching us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. And thank you for sharing with us. If you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church, you can do so. Because church ought to be your priority. It ought to be a part of your priority. You can do so by inboxing me and letting me know that you want to be a part of this great church in Southeast Texas. Southeast Houston, Texas. And we will welcome you. Those who have received Jesus Christ tonight, please come on and inbox me so we can rejoice with you for your reception of Jesus Christ, and we will celebrate with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. It is an offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail your offering, your tithes, your sacrificial gifts in to New Begin Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Begin Church, P.O. Box. 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Again, thank you for joining us. If you're in the, in the room and you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served.
Father God, we thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to give unto you. We thank you for money. We thank you for increase. We thank you for income. We thank you, Father God, for all that you have provided for us. We thank you for every resource. We ask you to bless us, Father God, as we give unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. Why don't you come forward and, and leave your offering here, and we will close out for tonight.
We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. God bless you and God keep you. Here's our prayer.